The glasses, but they can't figure it out with the clothes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're good. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you so much to each of you who's joined the Hangout, and thank you to everybody in the class for um, tuning in. And it's a great, delightful pleasure to introduce Doug Glanville, uh, who's joining us for the Hangout today. Uh, Doug is a former Major League Baseball player. He played for several teams, including the Chicago Cubs and the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, he's a, a wonderful writer. Uh, he writes for the New York Times, among other um, venues, and is the author of this terrific book, which is recommended for our class, The Game From Where I Stand, really wonderful book about baseball. Um, and he's also a main commentator for ESPN, the main sports network in the U.S. Uh, about baseball. Uh, so uh, I wanted to invite him because he, ha he he's, has a lot of interesting things to say both about baseball and um, about sports. And uh, I know that baseball is a sport that's played mostly in the United States. There's not sometimes not that much interest in baseball in other countries. Uh, but I think there are a lot of interesting questions around around baseball, including why it is so popular in the United States and maybe not so popular um, in other places. Uh, and so this will just be a chance for us to um, chat with Doug. And um, uh, Doug, maybe if you want to say a few words and we'll, we'll um, get things going. Yeah, well, no, it's a pleasure to, to be on. I First time on Hangout, so this is exciting. I was an engineer in college. I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. So I've always appreciated the convergence of technology and sports. I started playing pretty much as soon as I could hold, hold the bat. My, my brother played baseball. Uh, he didn't play professionally, but he taught me the game uh, as he was seven years my senior. And, uh, you know, I grew up in Teaneck, New Jersey, which is – uh, a town that was very important in, in the integration uh, in the 1950s with the school system. So it was sort of a town that where black and white came together in the U.S. And I was, you know, I grew up in an environment where people were bridging differences and learning how to work with a diverse swatch of our country. Uh, I think that tone always set how I express my ideas uh, and, and eventually in writing in how to bring people together uh, through differences. And, and I felt that baseball was something I loved growing up. It was a good forum by which to connect people. And I found a perfect storm in writing about the drug culture when the steroids and all those things broke because it was a way to kind of get inside the human uh, element that, that goes on in the locker rooms that was kind of getting missed when people were trying to name call and name name. And I started writing off of this idea that people can learn about all these life lessons through through baseball, and uh, you know, so that's uh, that was probably about five years ago when I started writing this column, and then it led to this book and led to ESPN, and and so now today I, I live in Hartford, Connecticut, which is close to ESPN studio, and I have three kids uh, who are five, three, and one, so they're pretty young. <laughs> My wife uh, is from the Philadelphia area, so. Uh, so, no, I'm very happy to be here. Duke is close to my heart. My family is from Rocky Mount in Raleigh, North Carolina. So um, it's a, it's very, I'm very happy to be here. So I look forward to your questions. Great. Maybe just to start out, since as I was saying, uh, about two-thirds of the people in Coursera courses are not from the United States um, and maybe don't know all that much about baseball. Could you just talk a little bit about what you see as the distinctive pleasures of playing baseball? We've talked a lot about the pleasure of sports in the course and, and what it is. I mean, each sport has particular things that are, are fun about it and that draw people in about it. Could you just talk a little bit about baseball and what its distinctive um, joys and pleasures are? Well, you know, no question. My, my father was from Trinidad and Tobago, so he grew up with cricket. And certainly baseball is in that family. So that's sort of where the international uh, connection is. Uh, I, I love baseball because you, you play every day. So once you reach the major league level, there's 162 games uh, a year, but it's in a 180-day season. So it's very compact. And I think you get this day-to-day -day effect where people connect to it because you're, you're performing every single day, just like anybody's going to work every single day. And there's something about that experience that 
drives people and connects people in a different way than some a sport that plays once a week or three times a week. Um, you know, we have to do it every day, whether we're sick or tired or bad leg or happy, no matter what. And I, and I think learning how to produce and perform every day creates a, a different environment. I also, you know, love the pacing of baseball. You have this one-on-one uh, -on -one experience between pitcher and hitter in this world of teamwork around them. You have defense and offense and you have uh, teammates, but there's this moment where it's just me against you and you're still weighing all these things that are important to the team at the same time trying to do your individual job. So it's a very hybrid sport in that way and and it, it thrives off of anticipation. It thrives off of, oh, here's the crescendo about to happen. You're you're hoping, you're wishing, you're looking forward to what's possible. And you fill in those blanks with all the experiences you come from. So I, I always enjoy that. It has this very blank slate to it, too, that uh, can bring people in this common space. So, um, you know, it's a great game. I love it. I played it since I was four, pretty much pick up a bat. And, uh, you know, I still love it. I just Now I just write it instead of play about it. Play it. <laughs> Could you actually talk a little bit more about writing about sports because uh, and in particular about what kind of insights you think you have or don't have as somebody who played the game at a high level um, because you know, we've read a lot of scholarship and writing by um, journalists and academics in this class who are not athletes uh, but are writing about sports and yet we also have examples like you, like there's a guy named Michael Oriard who writes wonderfully about the NFL, was a former Kansas City chief offensive lineman. But if you could talk a little bit about um, being a writer and actually having played the sport and, and what the, and obviously everybody who played a sport is not necessarily going to be able to have the writing talents to write well about it. I mean, the people who are talented writers are pretty rare in our society in general or in the world in general. Um, so could you could you talk a little bit about that? Well, no doubt. The um, well, I think the, the the jumping off point for my connection to baseball and bringing it to sort of a wider our audience is through really a human lens, the common experience. And I think if you start off the premise that you know much of our experiences, even as major league athletes or professional athletes, are shared, that you know my book uh, talks a lot about my father's illness throughout. Uh, a three-year period in particular where uh, he was sick, and that's something that everyone can relate to. So my writing style really still reflects my experience growing up in New Jersey and things that I went through. I recognize that sports some takes this unique skill set from an athletic standpoint, uh, maybe even a perseverance standpoint, that you can throw 100 miles an hour, you, you're seven feet tall, or you're a 350-pound lineman. There are unique elements, but in the end, there's so much more to talk about that's common uh, and, and I think can resonate with people. Uh, one of the main concepts or ideas that I work off of is that divine inspiration you know, come, can come from people, you know, just the human side of, of that divinity. And, and we create, you know, we're playing games and people are watching us and people have, get inspired by uh, enjoying people perform these sports. And you can separate yourself a lot and go, wow, I could never do that. I could never jump as high as Michael Jordan. But there's a lot of things that Michael Jordan experienced that, that everybody can feel inspired by that's not necessarily connected to the unique skill sets that he has to be able to, to perform. So I focus in a lot on writing about where we all fall into the same space, whether it's having a baby during your career, whether it's getting traded and not wanted, maybe it's uh, injury and trying to recover from – uh, you know, a bad knee or anything along those lines that everybody can connect to. And I think that that's where I enjoy the most because I learn so much from people who aren't even necessarily fans of the game. Could you say also a little bit about um, the contrast between writing about sports and uh, doing sports on television? Obviously, they're very different time frames. You have a minute or two minutes or three minutes or – not very long often on TV, whereas with a book you have a lot more space to expound ideas. But um, could you talk a little bit more about that since you've had experience both as a um, on ESPN, on television, and as a, as a writer? Yeah, well, no question it was a tough transition for me to go from, you know, I was writing for the New York Times, and then all of a sudden I was at ESPN, and their, their delivery is are, they're very different. 
Uh, for starters, as you mentioned, you have more time to expand as a writer. Uh, my columns may be 1,500 words, and I can get into depth. I can kind of there's nuance. But at ESPN, when you're you know I'm on Baseball Tonight, and you have 30 seconds to express a very complex idea, and you have to learn how to really focus on the key elements. And if you don't get to every point you want to make, uh, you try to go to another avenue to to write about it or expand elsewhere. So it, it's learning how to pick the most important elements that resonate with the audience. Uh, in a way that's very different than writing. So it took time for me to really learn what was important. And I also had to recognize that when they asked me a question, I didn't have to make every point. I didn't have to make five points out of it. It might be just pick the top two and then you know expand on those. So it helped me sift through the most um, the key points. It helped me sift through what points connected with people the most and uh, and recognizing that you'll have time in other places to follow up. Uh, you know, so, so it's a little bit of a soundbite versus this sort of expansive, uh, you know, area where you can write in. So I had to learn how to combine those. And I feel very comfortable now. I feel like a minute is an eternity now. So so I've learned how to bring them together, and I still have my writing platforms to, to expand if I need to. Great. So um, let me open things up to uh, questions to all the rest of you. Well, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, I'm interested in when you were in school and in um, when you went to college, how easy it was for you to combine the, your studies with your sport. Because I think you said you were tra you were doing engineering. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So that's a significant workload. So how did you manage to balance your success there and managing to do the sport as well? Well, one thing that helped was uh, my mom was a teacher and. So I went to junior high school, which was seventh grade through eight. In my case, it was seventh and eighth grade. And then high school, my mom graduated with me, so to speak, and followed me to the high school. So it helped to have her presence for a good chunk of my schooling that, to learn how to balance schedules and do many things at once. Uh, fortunately, I had a very good high school that gave me a head start into preparing for the engineering curriculum at the University of Pennsylvania. So I was able to take one less class than the typical engineering load in the spring when we were playing, and that gave me a little more time to be able to balance the two. Uh, but it certainly, it, the juggling took time to, to master, but it did help me a lot once I became a professional, which was when I was 20 years old. I had, to, I had a lot to navigate off the field, whether it's dealing with the press or learning how to find an apartment or get insurance and all these things. That helped me a lot in my experience in college to know how to deal with the experience of trying to make it to the major league. Because in baseball, it's a pyramid. You start at the low level. When you, when you get drafted, you, you sign your contract, you start in A ball, which is the bottom rung. And then you go up the pyramid. You go to double A, then you go to triple A, and then the big leagues. And it's not guaranteed. There's only a small percent that make it through that, that pyramid. And, you know, you have to – a lot of the times I – felt that there was very talented players that got distracted from the, you know, the goal because there are so many things around you as a professional athlete, whether it's you know, the social element, the, the drug culture, whatever it is. So a lot of players got derailed in trying to chase the dream before they were living the dream, so to speak. <laughs> and um, you know, that focus that I was able to have came from my experience growing up, and I think that really helped me balance everything. Okay. Others? Uh, I have a question. Uh, may I ask now? Yes. Uh, I'm also a sports journalist, and it is a pleasure uh, to hear what you are mm, saying uh, in your uh, long career. In so many years, there, you have the experience uh, to know more than me, of course. I'm just 21 years old and have a, a lot of way to pass. And uh, my question is about the uh, Olympic uh, Committee shortlist, which was announced uh, two days ago. Uh, according to it, wrestling. Um, baseball squash uh, going to compete for their place in uh, London 2012 Olympics. I would like to know what are your thoughts on this and which uh, one of these three will have its place in the future. Noreen, we couldn't hear, the question was about the Olympics and what sport will be, will be yes. 
I've read about the rest of the bus, the rest of the be brought. Yes, exactly. Yeah, well, I can certainly, you know, I can speak to the baseball sign in that, um, you know, I know baseball, when the U.S. won the gold at one point, you know, and there's always this debate about the amateur players or the players that aren't necessarily the marquee stars in the United States in Major League Baseball, you know, their ability to play in the Olympics and even the World Baseball Classes, which is another international event. Um, I mean, certainly I root for baseball to be uh, more global. Uh, it has certainly a lot of the universal elements, in it, and I think slowly they're developing talent across the world. There's players starting to come from different countries, it's expanding. Uh, the World Baseball Classic has helped that, as you see players from the Netherlands and, and uh, other countries. So uh, I think it has a little ways to go. You're certainly not on the international level of soccer, for example, uh, or football, as, as some countries will refer to it. So, uh, you know, baseball, I think, has a lot of universal lessons that can be very powerful. But I know on the U.S. side, there's, there's always this friction and tension figuring out who's going to play. Uh, you remember USA had the basketball team, the dream team, where all the NBA stars played, and they, they played a fantastic, uh, you know, Olympic, they made a, a Olympic history in the way that they performed. Uh, baseball's not quite there yet, and I don't think it's quite as popular as, say, football and basketball are, and, and American football in the States, but it's a, it's a strong third, and, and maybe one day we'll uh, sort of reconnect with the Olympics. I think it would be great. I've got a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, we've been talking a, quite a bit about athletes getting paid in college and the possibility of that. I know you went to Penn where there aren't athletic scholarships and that sort of thing. What are kind of your feelings on that? Because I happen to live in SEC country where people are crazy about athletics. You see how big um, the Southeastern Conference can get and how much money these programs can bring in. But what are your thoughts about, you know, athletes in college getting paid? Yeah, and this is a, a never-ending uh, discussion, and, and there's certainly compelling elements on both sides of the coin. I, I certainly know as an amateur, if you're truly an amateur, I, I was at Penn, so once again, the money wasn't there to kind of, quote-unquote, corrupt the sport in a sense. So we just played. There was five people at my game, you know, nobody <laughs> – bought tickets and, and that was it. So I, I could just be an amateur, go to college, and hope for the next next level. Like you said, in the SEC, it's an entire different animal and they're making millions of dollars, paying coaches multi-millions of dollars to, to run what is considered amateur programming. So I think that you have to work very hard to strike a balance because the danger is if you start paying these guys, you know, college athletes 150,000 a year, uh, you know, you can definitely run into, uh, you know, issues there in terms of, you know, managing it and, and responsibility. I mean, major league athletes, major league baseball players and other professional athletes are already proving that they're making tons of money and having a lot of difficulty managing it post-career, divorce, running into all kinds of challenges personally. Uh, it's, not, it's not this universal elixir that solves problems. It, it creates a lot of new elements. And, you know, you're asking 18, 19-year-olds to, to deal with that. That's a challenge. So you have to be very careful. Uh, in terms of where the, uh, the, the money is generated, you have to credit these athletes. They're playing, and people are paying to see them play. Uh, they, they certainly should have some, uh, something, you know, be recognized for that. Uh, but I, I'm very cautious about, you know, writing a blank check and saying athletes just get paid across the ball. I think there's a way you can do it carefully and responsibly where you can kind of meet the goal. Uh, but I, I advise everybody that's involved in that decision to think it through very cautiously and always be open to going back to the table because it's, it's very complicated. If I could ask another uh, uh, question about another hot button topic, uh, we've talked about um, gay and lesbian issues and sports, and we talked about the Jason Collins announcement of a couple weeks ago, and this phenomenon of um, – gay players, especially gay male players and major team sports, um, not being willing to come out of the closet when they're, at least during their playing careers, is not just a U.S. one, but a global one. There's not a single out player in the British Premier League or the Italian City A um, right now, for example. Um, 
but we, we still don't have a, a, a Major League Baseball player who's ever come out during their playing career. I know there's a number who've come out afterwards. And I wonder if you could speak to that. Is it more my own image from a distance is that basketball is a little more uh, socially liberal culture. It's basketball seems to be more Obama voters and a little bit, whereas baseball and football seem a little bit more um, red state um, in their in their ethos and politics. I don't know if that has anything to do with different levels of receptivity or tolerance around gay and lesbian issues. But I wonder if you could speak to that. I mean, I think in general to the issue of gay and lesbian identity in sports and in particular to the situation in professional baseball. Yes, well, no doubt. Well, in comparing the sports, uh, that's true. I mean, baseball, part of the culture of baseball is this very old school, historic respect uh, philosophy. And that there's greatness in that because Baseball is obsessed with its history, its records, its numbers, and it goes back and it compares and contrasts all the time. But the flip side of that, it's very slow to change. It's very, you know, very almost like turning that sort of, uh, you know, ocean liner around to get a, a different perspective. So that's the drawback. And I think when it comes to, for example, Jason Collins coming out in basketball, is basketball is probably an environment I would think is the, the best suited to sort of just turn the page and say, hey, this guy's just a good player, and that's, you know, move on. Uh, baseball, I think, is a lot slower in that environment. And, you know, part of it is the culture of this macho world of sports. And, and it's, in a way, it's a shame because we, we kind of attach this domain of how sports inspire us through this very male, heterosexual lens that these are the performers of the sport, and that's how it's kind of supposed to be. And then when you're and I played, there's this culture of you know whether it's womanizing or you know you just have this conquest mentality that's you know you know Napoleon taking over Russia type of thing, and I feel like there's you miss out on the diverse way and the diverse type of people or person that can inspire you, um, you know. And I don't think sport sport is very narrowed when you try to put the check in a box as to who can perform it and who can inspire you as an athlete. And, and so I think it's a natural progression to acknowledge that since the dawn of any sport, people of all walks of life have inspired us through their, to their performance. Uh, we may not know it because they were out or we may not think about it, but when you look at the Olympics as an example, there's so many phenomenal stories from, from whether it's uh, hand, people working with handicaps or people from, you know, Aborigine from Australia, uh, inspiring stories, great stories. And, you know, so I feel that the, the sport needs to grow to recognize that the people who perform it are conduits to something much bigger than the individual. Uh, and Jason Collins taking that step was a big step. And I think if he's successful, and, and for example, if he signs with a team this year in the NBA, then I feel like other athletes will start to come behind him. And, uh, and he's a player that's, you know, he's a very good defensive player, very, a very a lot of intangibles and well-respected. I, I think that, He's a good example of how this could open up the doors, no doubt. More questions. Where, yeah. where do you stand on the uh, restructuring, uh, uh, restructuring of the baseball signing uh, bonuses? Because football has gone now to more, more, more. Uh, they, they've restructured. They don't give these huge uh, signing bonuses, but it seems like baseball is still the one sport that's left where. A lot of people are getting really huge money, and people on the other end are getting nothing. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, well, what I appreciate about baseball is the contracts are guaranteed contracts. Uh, you know, so there's a lot more security. There's more security for your future. Um, you know, injuries obviously happen. It's ironic because football, where you're definitely at the greatest risk of health, uh, you know, they don't have guaranteed contracts. Their signing bonus is their guarantee. So they play and. They get hurt. It's like, oh, sorry. You know, I know we signed you to a 15-year deal, but she got hurt in the first week, so I'll see you later. Uh, I think that's very dangerous, and it reflects how the transition from football is so tragic in a lot of cases. Uh, you see that whether it's the suicides, whether it's the the bankruptcy, uh, there's a lot of problems in athletes transitioning, but football has a very severe problem with that. Uh, and baseball. I, I do appreciate the fact that they, they give some security. Now, I, I also, yeah, you sign a guy to $200 million, and 
you know, the guy's already 33 years old. It's probably not going to end up a very good deal in the back end. But, you know, when you're Alex Rodriguez, for example, he, he makes plenty of money for New York that's not necessarily on the field, and that's what they count on. There's a marketing component. And that, necess that necess doesn't describe your value as a player, but it is on the business side of the game. So, um, you know, I, I've played about 10 seasons Major League. I played five others, so about 15 seasons professionally. And I have a, a pension plan that will be in place. Uh, there's benefits, there's defined benefits. There's, uh, I can, you know, buy into the health plan. Uh, so I feel like it, they set me up very well for life after the game. And, and that's a good thing because a lot of these players were centered to center uh, and certainly central to communities uh, that if they're healthy and they're transitioned, they should be in a better position to give back and be part of that, that consciousness. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do in that area, however. Could you just to follow up and, and along those lines, there's a um, philosopher dead now. He was a philosopher at Yale named Paul Weiss who wrote a book I mentioned on the discussion boards called Sport a philosophical inquiry and one of the main contentions that he made is that sports is a bit unique in the world as a profession because it's one where youth excel and where you can be in your late teens or early 20s or mid 20s in the case say of a LeBron James or a Lionel Messi and be at the top of the world and this is different from other um, you know realms of society in the sense that business politics a lot of other professions, you have to work your way up, and maybe you're, you know, it's not until you're 40 or 50 that you become president of the United States or CEO of your company. So he said that he argued that actually sports is particularly appealing to the young because it's a place where they can, they can excel right away. I'm just curious about your your views about age and sports, and since you've gone through uh, the, the life cycle of being a a much younger man and playing professional sports now being still a young man but older going into middle age and and being a broadcaster just to t talk a little bit about age and sports well there's no question that you know the game you look at baseball for example you have players like Mike Trout uh, Manny Machado Bryce Harper these guys are 20 21 years old and uh, and certainly if you're playing tennis and you could be 13 or 14 or skating uh, so it is where youth dominates, and in fact, the culture around it, as you get older, you're very conscious of it. I mean, I finished playing when I was 34, 35 years old, so, and I was looked at as a guy like over the hill, you know, you're done kind of thing. It's, uh, it's amazing how quickly you can go from youth to age, uh, you know, in, in a blink of an eye. Uh, I think that, you know, as an athlete, certainly your body response, your recovery, everything is accelerated as, as you're younger, but the... What's tough about being a young athlete is you have to be youthful in your age and your physicality, but then you also have to have the maturity to be at the top of a field and understand the responsibility on that to sustain yourself. And that's not an easy equation because if you're young, you certainly aren't as experienced and you have certain tendencies, whether it's distractibility and all these things that tend to go with it uh, because you're learning. And but you have to you have to be Bryce Harper at 20 when I was like raking leaves in the back of my yard. This guy's at the top of the Major League Baseball chain. Uh, very difficult, and you see a lot of issues off the field at times when guys are kind of rushed to the big leagues, uh, and you know the personal lives don't always uh, jive with their on-field success. Uh, it's a tall order, and uh, but I know that you know Twitter, all the social media, the way fans are engaged with players you know, speaks a lot to the youth culture and how baseball and other sports can set that tone. Uh, I think that's great for the sport, but there is a lot of responsibility that comes with it that is harder on someone who's, who's younger as opposed to older. Mm -hmm. uh, others of you who haven't had a chance to ask a question, uh, Luke Roger, is that how you say your name? Yes. Um, I'd like to talk more about injuries and was there any pressure um, if you ever got injured to really like rush back onto the field given how much uh, players are being played our players are being paid well yes there definitely I mean I'll give you a very specific example in 2003 I, I signed with the Texas Rangers which at the time looking back was like you know obviously the center of the steroid culture in baseball and uh, you know but I played and I, I tore my hamstring tendon so I got hurt and I was a free agent when I signed with Texas 
and I was a free agent the year after Texas if everything went well. So I was out, and I ended up missing uh, three and a half weeks to come back, and then another three weeks just to get back in major league shape. And sure, there was a lot of pressure because that was my free agent year. That was the year that if I played well, I could really set up for you know the next level uh, for life and just have that multi-year contract. But wasn't the case. I ended up tearing my hamstring, missing uh, what ended up about two months before I really felt right. And, you know, so there's a lot of pressure in that situation to get back on the field quickly and perform well, uh, especially as your job hinges on it uh, the following year. And so I think there is truth to a lot of these players that talk about, well, I took performance enhancing drugs because I, w I felt desperate that this could have been my last year and I needed to get healthy again quickly. I think there's definitely truth to the reasoning. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of pressure to get on the field. Uh, when you're not in a long-term contract situation, for sure. Uh, and and uh, people will do desperate things to get back uh, and obviously, in many cases, break the law. Brian, do you have a question? Yeah, I had a question about uh, kind of the fan-player interaction. Um, I remember reading about Roberto Clemente and his kind of connection to um, – you know, the city of Pittsburgh interaction with fans or hearing the players, you know, ride to the ballpark or walk to the ballpark and how that's changed and evolved over time. And I'm curious, from your playing days until now, how do you think social media and the 24-hour news cycle has changed the way players interact with fans? Oh, it's changed, in, I mean, infinitely, and it will forever be changed. Um, you know, the way I engage fans, you know, I had letters and people sent me letters, you know, and I, and I wasn't until I stopped playing in 2005, this is not that long ago, but the social media explosion has given 24 hour access. Uh, just look what happens with the umpires in baseball, the, the referees of baseball. They're, every call they make now is on every Twitter, everybody follows it. They're under such intense uh, observation now uh, that these things change games. They change rules of games. They change culture. Uh, you know, I remember Kevin Euclid earlier was, was last year was traded, and his the information, the leaking of the rumor about him being traded was already out on Twitter before it happened. So when he played his last game in Boston, everybody knew it was his last game, and so they standing ovation. They gave him, and and this was something that typically would would have been under wraps when I played until you were traded. And they go, like, oh, sorry, see you later. Uh, you know, so the information cannot be contained. Uh, fans now can get direct access to players and, and send a tweet out and they respond and you can get inside information about what they were thinking, what, what happened on that play. Uh, so there's no doubt the speed is, is uh, exponentially accelerated and I imagine that will continue uh, you know, as, we, as we get more technology to be able to be inside, uh, inside the game and inside the mind of these athletes. We have time for a few more questions. I've actually got a question about ESPN and working there. Are you ever amazed at how much influence a station like that can have? Like I know Professor Starn loves his soccer or football, depending on where you're at, but it seems like ESPN really focuses on that when ESPN's about to televise a soccer match or the fact that NHL used to be huge with ESPN when they had the contract of showing NHL games. Are you ever surprised at how much – uh, a place like ESPN can influence, you know, how everybody else is thinking about sports. Oh yeah, it, it's it's amazing the the influence as you mentioned. And well, one thing I notice is whenever I go to studio, you know, it's a giant campus of all these buildings. There's digital centers, there's labs, there's everything. Um, they're always under construction. There's always something that they're adding and building. There's no complacency at ESPN, which I appreciate. They're always looking. They, they don't forget that they came from uh, sports that aren't quite as popular in the U.S. They, they followed the uh, America's Cup. They followed rugby. They, they did everything, and, and they still do everything. Um, there's no doubt that that world view and, and that influence is very central and important to ESPN, especially the fans that are avid fans that really love and, uh, and eat, drink, and sleep their sports. Uh, but it's a tremendously powerful place. And I remember I just did a debate on SportsCenter one morning, and we were voting on who, who won the debate. It was about whether fans are getting out of control. I think it was when um, there was some incident where some fan got into an altercation. And I think in the, like, the three minutes that I debated, there was one million people on Facebook voting on this thing. 
So I mean, you know, and I, you know, it's just astronomical, and um, and I just hope, and I hope they continue to be conscious of the responsibility of getting it right, making sure the information is there, not being first. And I think that's the danger with social media sometimes, or reporting is like be first, and you know, everybody has a mouthpiece. So you're trying to sift through credibility, and you're trying to sift through the patience of letting the story unfold and getting more information. Uh, I, I think they are generally very cautious about that, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, and I, you know, so I don't know. First, you know, first this certainly gets the attention, but to sustain, uh, you need to be accurate and and truthful and uh, do honest reporting. And uh, you know, hopefully that will continue to be the standard. One thing that we've or issue that we've explored in the class is is whether. Um, Americans and people around the world watch too much sports now, and it's you know it's easy. We've talked about the you know, cultural and media revolution that's taken place over the last forty years, and how it's easy to forget that you know, that sports wasn't even broadcast in prime time until the nineteen seventies during the week. So for like a kid like me growing up in the late sixties and early seventies. The only sports you could watch was the baseball game of the week on Saturday, and if you wanted to watch sports on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you, know, you were out of luck. And now we live in the world of 24/7 sports streaming, broadcasting, cable networks, internet, and in general, this is one of the theme. We're talking about the theme of of the phenomenon of fandom this week. But there's been this shift in in the world in the United States from um, in the er, back a uh, hundred years ago, people, yes, listening to some baseball broadcasts, reading some about sports in the news, but people doing more playing of sports than watching of sports. Whereas now that's flipped, and even college students will usually tell you, "Yeah, I play on the intramural volleyball team or basketball team, but I probably spend more time watching ESPN and streaming sports than I do playing them." And so I wonder if you could. I mean, great, it's relaxing and fun to watch sports. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, one could also argue that we've created a nation of couch potatoes, that sports doesn't exactly lead, even though it's really fun and interesting to follow, it doesn't really lead necessarily into deep conversations about politics and the meaning of life and so forth. So would, you know, do you, the question that is, is, do you think sports occupies too big a place in our imagination and our, our media sphere now in 2013? Well, you know, I wouldn't say too big of a space. I, I think it's more figuring out, once you've said, is, it, is, is there this conflict between, like, those who watch it and then play it, and as a result, they're choosing. Um, you know, there's no doubt that in the U.S. in particular, you know, there's an obesity epidemic, especially with young kids uh, coming up. And, you know, video games, you know, all these elements that can keep us on our, our couch. Uh, but, but I do feel that, when I look back at you know, my childhood, I watched, always watched the game of the week, and I watched this week in baseball. I watched all these shows. I read it. I always took in sports all the time, but I was also outside, you know, and I was imitating all these people. I felt like you can balance the two. I know it, if you look at the numbers, and I, I can't speak exactly, but I know that ESPN, you know, makes sure they know how many people spend how much time on the website and watch. I mean, we lose viewers, you know, fairly quickly in our show, so it's about capturing people's imagination in the early part of the show. Most people are doing a lot of other things. And so I think it's more than just sport. It's just the, the world of distraction or just multi, many options that we have to entertain ourselves. And, you know, you can carry your iPhone around or phone around and watch, you know, all kinds of things even when you're actually out. So I don't know, are you actually watching or are you doing? I don't know. So it's a, it's a different world, and I, I do think – Sport in general fits into in sort of a universal consciousness no matter what era. It's almost like music, the expression of your body, expression of sound. Uh, I think it will always be there, and um, you know, I, I don't think it always has to work in, against it when you're actually enjoying it in your downtime. Mm -hmm. Brian, you had a question? I, I had a question. Yeah, I, I was going to ask. Uh, Brian, and then um, we'll yeah, go to Rita. Yeah. Yeah, uh, what is your take on uh, fans and governments being asked to foot the bill for um, new stadiums? You know, I, I live in St. Petersburg where we have the Rays, who are a good team but struggle with, with fan support, and there's always this kind of, in a sense, I would say, threat by the team to you know move the team if the city doesn't step up uh, and, and pay for a new stadium. You had the situation 
with the Marlins in Miami in football you had the Vikings and their stadium issue and how do you feel uh, about fans oftentimes paying for a portion of these stadiums but not getting in a sense any benefit other than being able to watch sports well no I, I feel very strongly about this, the towns the surrounding area should have benefit um, and and there should be a, a connection with the communities in the surrounding areas and there's no doubt that there's a lot of potential for that and then sometimes the cities do it well where you know you're employing X amount of people and that's important to the, to the economy of your city uh, whether it's revitalization projects that you know come in as a result of the stadium being there to build up areas and to improve opportunity so if they're very diligent about those elements I think it's a, it's a good fit now if you go in and, and it's just a parasitic relationship where you go in and just take all the resources and and then extort and try to leave and you know I think that's very problematic and I'm sure there's cases of, of both but you look at like San Francisco for example the Giants they did a, that funding privately you know, they kind of raise money so the model can be done if you really just want to foot the bill yourself. Uh, people will pay for it, but um, I, I think it's still to me it could be a better opportunity if the community gets involved and really has say as to what goes up there and how it's engaging with the community. Then uh, a lot of potential because there's great you know job resources. It's something that people can care about and be part of and give pride in the city. So the positive side. Has potential. It's just a matter of, of of these cities and these teams taking advantage of that. We'll have our last question from Rita. Rita, where are you? From, where are you um, broadcasting I'm, from? I am broadcasting from just thirty miles north of London in England. Uh, oh, hello. Hi. How are you? Right. So my question actually is the um, whether the, going to see the very top teams, and I'm speaking in England, for example, if I want to go and see a really top soccer team, football team, my team is the Spurs, but I, you know, if I want to go and see the Arsenal play, for example, at the Emirates Stadium, so it's a corporate stadium, it's actually out of, it's not possible for poor people to go anymore. I worked at the Olympics last year. And I can tell you, I saw some swimming because I was working there. But you'll hear from people in England, the vast majority of people couldn't actually afford to go to the Olympics. So my question to you is, do you think that the sport is no longer a democratic process, that actually top sport is now only for people who are wealthy enough to attend? And I, I know to get a front row seat in Los Angeles to watch the Lakers, for example, you know, David Beckham can take his kids, but the vast majority of Americans can't actually get to see that game. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. No, I agree with you. I think it's, uh, there's no doubt um, you, you, there's, a, there's a disparate... Uh, you know, especially in the financial arena, uh, as to how people can enjoy the sport live. I mean, you, you go get four tickets and four hot dogs and parking and transportation and gas, and all of a sudden, you know, you're you're paying two hundred fifty dollars. It's just not feasible, uh, and and the audiences are going to reflect that. Um, there's there's no doubt that some teams have efforts, especially like in the upper deck. You can six hundred level, like in Philadelphia, for example. Uh, they, they may discount tickets, but it's a very difficult just getting there. I mean, I live in Hartford in a town in Connecticut that has, in the city, there's only one grocery store in the entire city. And so people, just to get to it, have to connect two different buses. It's like, you know, they're already disadvantaged on some level. Now they can't even just get basic groceries. So it, it's, it's definitely a problem. And the Yankees saw that in their new park when they tried to sell those low seats Nobody was buying them because they were just ridiculous, so they cut the price in half. But even half is not enough for the average fan. So, um, you know, that is a challenge because what will happen is you will get this very wealthy upper-class audience uh, that it becomes this elite star power thing. Nobody else will fill the stands, and then everybody will be sitting in front of the couch and just watching every sport through that medium. And that that's not the the original sort of the nature of the game where you can actually go and engage fans it will create a different trajectory of the sport I mean maybe it's still sustainable but it's going to be very different and I think it's concerning when like you said people of all walks can't enjoy something that's so universal so we're at the end of our time I'd really like to thank all of you from the course for your great questions and for hanging out and I'd like to thank very much Doug for being with us. Again, this is his book, The Game From Where I Stand. He has a great website, DougGlanville.com, if you're interested in uh, 
um, learning more about him, and you can watch him on ESPN and read him in the New York Times and elsewhere. You're working on a second book still, Doug, is that right? I do have an outline. It's uh, I'm focusing on the next phase, not the career, but the transition from the career, and then how you reconnect with the game. Uh, so I've just I've been collecting so much. I don't know when to stop collecting because I keep talking to players. And so we'll see. But it's a uh, it's a work in progress. But I'm, I'm very excited about it. One last question for you: Is it harder to be uh, since you've been both a player, uh, a sportsman at an elite level, or a writer at an elite level? Uh, you know, it's. I, I love writing. Writing, and then I love playing, but writing feels very natural and comfortable in a very relaxed way. And so I think playing was harder than what I'm doing now. Um, the schedule at ESPN is, you know, I don't, 162 games, 180 days, I don't have that anymore, nor the bad hamstring. So, um, you know, I, I love writing. I've been in such a good space, and it's it's very comfortable. And I, I don't really have, I'm fortunate, I don't have, like, deadlines, like, oh, we got I, I can kind of write when I find the ideas, and I can take my time. It's it's a great fit for me. So, um, so I'm I'm enjoying my second career, and I feel very fortunate to have gone through something I love the first go around in baseball, and then having something else I love in writing. So, terrific. Thank you so much to all of you, and we'll be having another hangout with um, David Andrews, a, a sports studies scholar from the University of Maryland, uh, who's really great next week. So thanks a lot, and um, and we'll see you soon.